So uh, I'm very uh, happy to be here. I think ADAPT2 is, I think it's my second favorite conference. The f favorite is Apache Con. I'm an Apache guy, so of course I have to do, say that. But uh, it's, I think I've been at every ADAPT2 probably. Uh, I like Berlin, I like this place. The organization is fantastic, the crowd is fantastic, so very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Bertrand de la Creta. I'm uh, based in the French-speaking part of Switzerland. I work for Adobe Basel as a principal scientist in the AEM uh, core team, so working on architecture, on proof of concepts, on coaching, and that, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm a Sling committer, PMC member. I, I've been with Sling since the big beginning, together with, together with Carsten and uh, Felix Meshberger, who's not here. I'm also involved in the Apache Software Foundation, currently on the board of directors, so very much involved in, uh, in open source. Um, I'm usually ambitious when I do an abstract for a conference. Uh, this time, maybe a bit too much. I was, uh, I was hoping to have a prototype to show you of a uh, large-scale sling rendering farm. I do not have a finished prototype, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, but I've been exploring a number of things, and, and what happens when you start looking at that is that there are so many variants. There are so many directions that you can go. You know, we could do it with multiple instances, or with microservices, or with containers, or all of the above. Uh, so I've been exploring uh, building blocks which uh, can help us go in this, this direction. So this talk could be, could be called the challenges of building a uh, large-scale rendering farm, and I'll, uh, I'll explain uh, what this means and have some uh, yeah, building blocks, experiments that I think can be useful uh, in our reflection uh, about that. I've been looking at the program and a number of talks resonate with that. Uh, um, Carl and Dominic will be talking about deployment, which is totally in, this, uh, in the, the range of what I'm, I'm discussing here. Uh, there's, there's really a number of talks which uh, will help make that in, put that in perspective. So what, what is it that we, are, we want to build? Maybe first step back a bit and reflect on, uh, on how Sling is used and how it's been designed. So th the history of Sling uh, starts with Day Software, a Swiss company uh, founded in 1993, which did uh, interactive CD-ROMs at the time which was pretty in innovative in 93, and then started doing also very early uh, web content management. Uh, you know, the, as many, like many companies, it morphed into a web agency, and then they started doing uh, a CMS, content management system, for their customers. And Sling was actually donated to the Apache Software Foundation by Day Software, and it, it reflects the heritage of, of uh, you know, that, that design. So this is a typical uh, Sling system, and this is also how AEM works, because it's, it's based on Sling. And the idea is that you separate the authoring from the, the publishing. So, you know, in the authoring, you're creating content, you have a relatively small number of users, which can still be in the thousands if you have a big AEM system, but it's small compared to the web. And then on the right side, you have the web. So you have a hostile environment, you have no idea how many users, you can have big spikes. Yeah, you know, I don't have to explain all that to you, but it's, it's a very uh, unpredictable, uh, hostile in some ways, and, and bursty environment. So the way, uh, the way Sling was initially designed, of course you can use it in different ways, but the initial design was based on this model where you have an authoring system which has less load or more predictable load, where you create content, that's the, the work of the authors, and then you replicate the content to a bunch of publishing instances, which are mostly throwaway. The, the, you know, the, uh, Carsten was mentioning the edge, and these, these can be your edge servers. Uh, they can be located wherever it makes sense, uh, based on your geographical uh, needs. And each of these, uh, each of these system is, is a Sling instance, which might be tailored differently. The beauty of OSGI, uh, which is at the core of Sling means that you can have uh, cu customized, tailored Sling instances for that, which are, are different, uh, maybe just based on the run modes of Sling. So you can have a, a, the same jar file which starts a diff in a different way. And they all have their own small content. It's not, I mean, it's not small, it has all the content, but they all have their own uh, 
unimportant content repository, which is kind of like a big cache of, of everything. And this is, this is the, the Sling model. The thing is that um, when it was designed, usually you had, or almost always, you had an installation where you were dedicated your Sling instances to a single uh, customer or to a single tenant. So maybe, maybe you're running uh, several websites of the same company on these in instances, but it's a friendly environment. It's managed, you know, they, they have the same boss. So they will not be trying to hack each other or, or do weird uh, things, hopefully. Depending on your organization, it's not always the case, but in theory, uh, they should be friendly. So that's, that's the context of how Sling was designed initially, and I think that's how it's mostly used today uh, through AM. It's evolving, but that's, that's where we come from. Uh, so if we want to be, uh, you know, the modern trend, which is makes total sense, to be more elastic and to make the best use of resources, maybe you would like to have uh, server instances which are more specialized, so you can scale independently. And the, the, main, the main building blocks of the Sling uh, production pipeline, we'll go into more detail in this, but basically, it's a re resource resolution. You get a request, you have to find the resource that that's, uh, it maps to. And then you have the scripting and rendering. You probably know that in Sling, the scripts and the servlets are equivalent. I'll be talking about scripts because it, that's where the many of the challenges lie in, uh, in my, my approach. So you can say, okay, we have, uh, we have different modules for resource res resolution, scripting and rendering. This is pretty easy to do with Sling. With a provisioning model, you can do you know, different uh, personalized, customized instances, have load balancing in between, and then you can scale the, the various uh, stages uh, independently. This would be an ideal uh, system. And if you do this right, uh, you would like multiple developers, multiple tenants to see only their world. So they can do whatever, they can have their own rendering scripts, and they don't see each other's scripts, and they cannot attack them or hack them or whatever. That would be uh, an ideal system in terms of uh, operations, because then you can, you can you know, test stuff independently. That's the whole uh, microservices uh, story. Um, I like to talk about federated services. I, I don't like the term microservices too much because it doesn't always make sense to make each service micro. It's, it's great to have federated services where, you know, you things, services which do uh, have a specific task, but the specific task might not be totally micro. So I like to talk about federated services. It doesn't make much difference, but it, I th it might be a, a subtle uh, concept. So this is 2017. You know, uh, why doesn't Sling run as microservices? Uh, it's... Um, if you, if you were to look at this today, you'll probably end up with something like this. What are the, what are the different aspects of Sling? So you, you have the Sling engine, which is kind of the orchestrator of everything. Uh, you have the content repository. You have an HTTP front end, uh, uh, maybe does some caching. You have the resource resolver, which finds the resources. You have the script resolver, which finds the scripts. And you have the scripting and rendering, which puts the whole thing together and produces your, your uh, responses. That would be probably the default uh, setup today if you were you know, in the microservices uh, trend, which is very common. And then you have HTTP between all these modules. So I'm not sure if this is going to perform fantastically. You know, if, if, you, if you think about what's going to happen when you, when you make a Sling request, uh, you will go through all these modules Every time you have a network hop, you have an HTTP request, or maybe you could optimize that a bit, but it's still, uh, it would scale. So if you really need to scale, that might be, might be a good approach. But in terms of performance, it might not be uh, fantastic. And we'll see why Sling has, the way Sling is built today has a big advantage over that in terms of, of performance. I'm not saying this is totally wrong, but, uh, it might not be optimal in terms of the cost of operations and, and the performance that, that you get. I'm saying this is religious microservices, being a bit provocative here, but you know, uh, if you, if you, when you talk about with some people of microservices, no, the microservice needs to do its own uh, stupid thing and that's it. 
If you're building Netflix or, or Google, it might make a lot of sense. If you're building a website, uh, maybe your company is successful. It's probably not as successful as Netflix, or many companies are not in the same range of traffic as Netflix, and you might not need that, actually, for your, for your system. So it's nice and trendy, but will that perform? We might have to be, you know, make some compromises uh, with, with the, 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 the principle of the microservices to, to do something efficient. So let's have a, have a deeper look at the Sling pipeline. What actually happens when you, when you make a Sling request or, may, or when, you, when you create the rendering script or the rendering scripts that you need to produce a web page, which is the most typical uh, use of Sling. So the conceptual steps are this. You have a request come in. It hits the content repository, you could say, to find the resource that you need to find, which uh, is handled by the resource resolver, which, by the way, is very simple in Sling. Uh, it's, you know, the, I think one of the beauties of Sling is that, by default, there's no mapping. The, the, the path of the URL that you get matches the path of the content repository. It's very transparent. You can do mapping if you need, but you don't have to. You get a resource, and then you need to find a script. Finding a script is based on the resource, and that's also the beauty of Sling, based on the resource type. And then you have a script, and you execute it in a, in a scripting engine, and you, and you produce your output. So this is, you know, this is the four steps, or we think, this is, these are the four steps of rendering a web page uh, with Sling. The thing is, very often, or almost always, when you do that, you will have to use uh, Sling include functionality. You will have uh, you know, the core resource of your page, which might be a page resource. And then it has, sub, it has a subtree of images, or, or maybe the, the user comments are in a separate uh, area of your content repository, which might make sense in terms of um, uh, access control, etc. So most, in most cases with Sling, you're going to do Sling include. And then it means that this nice pipeline is actually, you're actually looping through that multiple times. If you, if you analyze that on some AM pages, it could be interesting to see how many times you're actually you know, doing this loop, including and including and recursively including stuff. And that's a lot of work happening. So you could, we could think it's, it's very inefficient. Actually, it can be pretty efficient if, it's, uh, if your system is set up right. Um, with the right setup, and this, this also touches on uh, Michael Durig's talk on uh, TarMK, of tomorrow, I think. Um, Michael Durig and Valentin, right? It's also a joint talk. Uh, if, if everything's set up right, this can all happen in memory. The, the, if you're using Oak with the tar files, which is usually what you do on a publishing uh, instance, uh, the tar files will be, will be cached, or the right tar files will be cached in memory. And this can all happen in memory if you have enough memory. So you have to be you know, on top of your stuff for, the scale, for scaling your, your instances. But it can be extremely efficient. And this is when uh, Sling performs best. So it's good to keep that in mind. And I think it exposes one thing that's implicit and that we often don't, don't talk about when we talk about Sling pipelines, is that actually doing that, you're doing content aggregation. You know, we think we're just, uh, you know, running templates on our content, but actually we, at the same time, we are doing content aggregation. We're starting from our main resource, and we're getting content from here and here and here and under the tree and here and here. So we're doing a big aggregation of the content. And that's one of my, the, the key findings of my, my research here, is that uh, if you want to be friendly to federated services, I think we should introduce an explicit step of doing content aggregation, the, the block in, in red, in green here. Uh, because because it, it actually happens. When, you know, when you're doing more than just a single resource uh, with Sling, you are doing content aggregation. So if we want to uh, be friendly to federated services, which might be a good idea in terms of scaling, uh, I think it's a good idea to introduce a content aggregator. Uh, and this also has a benefit that if you want to do a client-side rendering, which makes a lot of sense in, in, in some cases. Uh, you could output where you have the, the, the orange arrow between the two boxes here. You could output the JSON resulting of the content aggregation. 
to your client and let the client do uh, the rendering. But you, would do, you could do just one request, one HTTP request, and get your whole content if you have this explicit content aggregation step. You can do this with Sling today, of course. You can create your JSON uh, you know, aggregation servlet. I'm going to show in my experiments, I experimented a bit with uh, Sling Query, which is a module that was written by Tomek. I don't know if Tomek is here already. He'll be here. Oh, hi, Tomek. <laughs> uh, and and uh, just as an experiment to see how this can, this can, uh, this can be useful. So I think uh, I'll call that a reasonably federated uh, a Sling system as opposed to the religious mi microservices variant that I was showing before. I think it could look like this. Have uh, two main services here in my, my diagram. On the left, you have the content provider service, which includes the content repository, the resource resolver, and the content aggregator. So out of this box, you get aggregated content. You get everything you need to render your page or whatever it is that you're rendering at this time. And this then can be remoted. It's one more network hub. That's not the end of the world. You know, compared to, compared to bear sling instance, in this case, you will have just one more network hub which can be efficient because, you know, your services will have fast network and stuff. So I think this can be, I think introducing the content aggregator concept in the Sling pipeline can help us uh, move towards more uh, federated uh, Sling-based Sling systems. It's still mostly Sling. You know, you can run the same uh, rendering scripts that you have today in the, in the right-hand uh, box. Uh, we just have this new aggr content aggregation step which is explicit in this, in this case. The thing is, uh, if you want to run this for multiple tenants, if you want to have multiple developers, uh, potentially hostile, when you have multiple developers from different companies, there's, you know, there's no way you can trust them, uh, or you don't want to trust them, you need to, you, you need to introduce some isolation mechanisms. And some of the components of this, of this system here like the resource resolver, it can be the same for everybody. You know, with the, the, the Sling resource resolution rules are well established today. Uh, you could, could really use the same component for everybody without, without a problem. Um, on the other hand, the content aggregator, you would need to run some form of script, you know, yeah, because it needs to be tailored to, to your particular content. So in this case, you will need some sandboxing. I'll, I'll talk about what you need to sandbox, but you will need isolation between the, the scripts that you let your uh, users run. And the same thing for the, the scripting, the final rendering or scripting of the, the HTML or whatever it is that you're generating also needs to be sandboxed in, the same, in a similar way. And you also need isolation of the content, obviously. You want to, you know, you don't want tenants to see each other's content or be able to act on it. So uh, you would need these three uh, elements of isolation sandboxing for the content aggregation scripts or whatever you're using, uh, sandboxing of the rendering, the final scripts, and isolation at the content repository. So this is what uh, I've been experimenting about, and I, I'll, I'll mention in my experiments a few uh, techniques that can be used for, for doing that. So at the, at the theoretical level, what can you do for sandboxing and isolation? I have two different uh, parts here. On the left, the, the content, the pure content, isolation of the content itself, and on the right, the isolation of the scripts that you will need for aggregation and for, for rendering. At the repository level, uh, we have access control that's very solid in Oak, works well, it's been tried and tested. So you can certainly use a repository access control to do that. You would set up groups for your, the different uh, owners of the content and, and then uh, define your, your access control rules uh, to isolate them. Uh, it has two impacts on, on uh, you know, if you want to run multiple websites, for example, in the same instance. Uh, it has an impact on caching. You might have, you know, your caches might end up containing content from various uh, tenants that you want to isolate. So you might need isolated caches or, or change your caching uh, strategy. And also, uh, you will need a mapping of the path. 
If you, want, if you have one big content web suite tree and you put the, the, the example.com and foo.com websites, then uh, you know, they would have different paths. It would be like slash tenant, slash foo.com, slash my content. So you would need some mapping to make that appear as a root of the example.com website. That's not too hard. You could even do that at the, the front HTTP front end level. Uh, it's uh, something that we know how to do. So this could be, uh, I think this could be a very practical way of isolating the content. Just use access control, which is tried and tested and works well. Another thing that comes to mind when you have to segregate, uh, isolate content is using uh, jails. Uh, if you're familiar with the chain root mechanism in Unix Linux systems, you, would, you could take a subtree of the repository and make it appear as the root of example.com. So if I'm connected to the repository as an example.com uh, user, or a user that's a member of the example.com group, I would see slash ten and slash food example.com as my root. And then it makes everything transparent. That's very useful. We discussed that a bit on the Oak Dev list last week. Uh, it looks possible. Uh, people had, had some good uh, suggestions on, on how to do that. But as usual, the devil is in the, is in the detail. That's a new functionality. So if you implement that, it has to be solid, then it needs to be tested. And that could take a bit more time. So we have one option, which is the access control is known to work, and the jails on do not exist yet, and uh, would need to be implemented. But that would be, that would be very nice. Another option at the Sling level, you could use multiple Sling repository services. Sling internally uses an OSGI service called Sling repository to access the content repository. You could switch that based on the request, uh, have some form of switching. There's various tricks. You can ask Carl about that. He, we, we discussed that already. Switching, you know, switching an OSGI service based on uh, a thread local or something that tells you that the request belongs to someone or someone else. I don't think that would be too hard to implement. But also, same thing would have impact on caching. Or, uh, and it would probably expose a few bugs in Sling, because until now you've been assuming you had a single Sling rep switch with service. So there, there, there's a few ways of doing that, which could be, you know, re uh, the ones that require less work are a bit less comfortable, and the more luxury ones will, will need more work. On the right side, the scripting uh, and rendering. So uh, I have another slide on exactly what you need to sandbox in the script, but um, Basically, you don't want your script to do nasty things. You know, it should, you should restrict what, what exactly can the script access. Is it going to break your system by spending all the CPU on this, this one script? Uh, so there, there's various options. For me, the safest option is to have a custom language. If you create your own language, you can define exactly what it needs to do. So for example, for, for the content aggregation, if we say, okay, we use, a, we use Sling Query, it wouldn't be too hard to translate the Sling Query API into a, a small line, a mini language that can do just that. And then you're safe. Then, you know, in, at least in terms of what you give access to, it's very, it's nicely sandboxed and you cannot access anything else. So that's, that's a, a good, uh, can be a good option. Some of the templating languages uh, probably already do that. If you take HTL, the, the Sling, uh, you know, formerly known as Sightly, uh, it is inherently sandboxed because it, it just, you know, it defines exactly what it has access to. But HDL has a use API, which allows you to use Java or JavaScript objects. And this is not currently sandboxed. So, so you need to draw a line or limit the, what you can access with the use API to be fully sandboxed. I suppose things like handle, handlebars uh, might also be already inherently sandboxed. But they often give access to global things or environment, which might be, might be a problem. So this would mean more, this would need more investigation. Uh, I've also been looking at sandboxing Nashorn, which is the uh, uh, JavaScript engine in Java since Java 8, I think. Uh, it's possible, but not ideal. I'll show that in the experiments. The, that's the kind of thing which, you know, you start, it's easy, just, you know, block access to the Java classes and then say, yeah, okay, but what about the global environment variables and what about printing to the to standard out and, and these things? So it's not, it's not as simple as it might seem uh, initially. Sandboxing Java, we had many discussions uh, about this with, uh, with uh, my, my colleagues and, and in Sling as well. Uh, it, it doesn't look possible, really. 
uh, as, uh, running uh, hostile code from different people on the same JVM, that looks very dangerous. IBM had a program, uh, project to uh, create a multi-tenant JVM. That would have been fantastic. They canceled the project. It was probably, uh, they felt it was too hard. So this doesn't look like a real realistic option, unfortunately, because that would, be, that would be fantastic. But it's a virtual machine. So, you know, why can't we just run multiple sling instances, each in their own JVM, and then the isolation is provided by the operating system, and it's fine. But the problem is uh, it's not optimal in terms of uh, resource usage. You know, uh, every Java application will load their own uh, copy of the classes that you're using, so this uses memory, and then the memory that Sling itself uses for, for heap, you know, uh, caches and, and uh, the state that's in memory, this, this is all, thi you would also have multiple copies of that. So it's, it's certainly possible, but it might be suboptimal in terms of reusing resources uh, between, the, between the, uh, the, the, the different VMs. A bit more detail on, on what you need to sandbox in a scripting language. So assuming you want to run rendering scripts from different uh, tenants or websites, which might be hostile. Uh, first, if it's a JavaScript, but many, many of these languages uh, do that, it allows you to access Java classes. You don't want, you know, the, the, the obvious example is system.exit. You don't want your, your scripting code to, to run that. So you need to... to uh, um, you know, sandbox or, or, or block filter access to, to the Java classes that you can, you can access. It's not too hard. If you can give a custom class loader to your script engine, then it's relatively easy to limit the Java classes. It's probably not the hardest thing to do. Then in red, the cre cre um, this is just one example from a Sling tests, whatever. It's a, a small example script. Uh, you have a script creating a temporary file. Uh, this you know, this might be dangerous if you have two tenants uh, creating the same file, or you could find a tricks to access each other's file because of the, the because they, they would have the same identity at the OS level. So this can also be something that you need to filter. Uh, infinite loops, that's also a typical example. What if your script does an infinite loop and starts eating all CPU time? You will need to give limits. This is also, there's also a practical solution to that. You can say, okay, if your script takes more than 50 milliseconds, we kill it. I think that's one of, like, I think Google Cloud services work like that in some, some ways. Then, okay, just, uh, you know, fix your script so that it doesn't do that. That's also not too hard to implement if you need to do that, put limits like that on script. And then there's also the memory usage. What if the script starts creating big arrays and use all of your memory? So it's, uh, you know, it's challenging. There's many uh, angles that could be used to attack um, your system. And, you know, many events today tell us the, the attacking systems is a profession. Uh, for some, some people, it's how they make their money, unfortunately. So they can be very creative. So, so it's, it's kind of difficult. I think if you're sandboxing thing, I'm always much more comfortable with a whitelist approach. Here we're more to taking, talking about blacklist. You start with a completely open system and you start by, you know, limiting, oh, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. It's very easy to forget something when you do a blacklist. Whereas if you do a whitelist, you start by saying, okay, my script can do nothing. And then you add one instruction. Okay, can do that. Ah, I can test that. I can, I can verify that it's safe. I think that's much, uh, much safer. So if I had to do that, I would certainly, uh, yeah, look at doing many languages, uh, restrictly languages uh, where, where you, you know, where you can control exactly what happens or not. Then, of course, there's containers. I was mentioning multiple JVMs before. Uh, I suppose many, most of you are familiar with containers today. So you, can run, you could run the same things in containers. And that could actually be a good idea. Uh, if you minimize, actually it's the same with multiple JVMs. If you can minimize the, the, the amount of memory that you need for each instance, then it might make sense to run multiple of them and maybe move some stuff to shared pools. Like caches, you can maybe have a shared cache, uh, and you know, so that each instance is not too big. That could be a practical solution. Uh, if if you do that, uh, so many people will think Docker when we speak about containers. I think it's important to focus on con containers and not on Docker. Docker is, is a great way to run containers today, 
uh, but this is evolving. Uh, and you know, we might have different systems which run containers natively, uh, so I think it's good to yeah, put the focus on the containers. Okay, so what do we do? I've been you know, mentioning many, many options. If I had to do this for tomorrow, or maybe not for tomorrow, but for in one month for now, what would I do? I think I would combine that with um, something that I showed in my, my talk here last year with, with Shetan, where we did very dynamic routing of, of Sling requests. Uh, I think there, there's a number of things that you can share between multiple applications running on Sling, and this is, this is the box, at least the box on the left. So if you are using Oak to access your content, you have the resource resolver. Resource resolver, as we said, can be common to everybody. Does, you need customizations of the resource resolver in many cases. If we introduce this content aggregator, then I think the, the leftmost part here can be, uh, could be really shared. And then you might have uh, two, two sets of Sling services on the right here. On the top uh, box, we have shared, shared services. So things that where you run a restricted scripting language for your rendering, which is safe, which is isolated. And this is for maybe 98% or 99% of your requests. And then if you have a few things that need to do really specific stuff, you could route just that to a different set of Sling instances on the, on the bottom right here, um, based on the resource type. Uh, as I showed last year, you could, it's not hard to do the HTTP routing based on resource type if you resolved it in the first box. And then you could route a few requests to different instances, which might be belong maybe to just one application, to one tenant, and they pay for that. And I think that would be a pragmatic way of doing a, a, a large-scale uh, farm today, which is hybrid. It has some shared services, which are, can probably be used for a, a big percentage of your request, and then you have a few requests which need, which need to go to different systems. This touches the, um, the mostly the rendering part. If you need to do processing, like processing binary assets or stuff, then I think, uh, I think Carsten and David, you're going to show something with OpenWhisk, right? Yeah, so that uh, going, th going the Lambda route, you know, uh, Apache OpenWhisk, so you learn, if you're not familiar with that, you learn about that uh, in their presentation. Uh, so I think really going the, in a hybrid direction where you, you try to have most of your processing chain standard and then allow for exceptions by having some dynamic routing. That would be, uh, that would be the, my favorite choice if I had to do this today. Um, so what you, you would need to implement compared to what we have in Sling today, what you need to add is isolating content, which, as we said, can be done with uh, access control, probably need some utilities to make that uh, easy to operate. The content aggregator would be a new component. Maybe a uh, Sling query might be a good choice for that. You need, you know, we need to do more testing, but I, uh, in terms of functionality, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty good, and it's, uh, it's very well suited to the Sling model, which is, which is great. The content-driven routing uh, showed that uh, in my prototype last year. You take the resource type, and based on that, you route to a different HTTP uh, backend based on a request attribute or, or parameter or something, a request header. And then you would need uh, sandbox execution of the, the, the rendering scripts for the shared services. And something that I have not mentioned yet is a dynamic, so yeah, it was on my slide, but I, I forgot to mention it the dynamic search path, because your different applications will need different scripts. So you cannot use uh, today by default is slash apps and slash libs. You would need slash app slash example.com slash apps and slash example.com slash libs. So this needs to be made dynamic. I have a, I'm going to show how this can work in the experiments. So this is how I would do this today if I had to implement uh, something like that. So this has been a lot of talk and not too much concrete. And now we're going to go into a bit more concrete experiments. So as I said, I don't have a concrete version of the whole thing. I don't have a, a complete prototype to show. But I'm going to show some experiments that I've been doing along the way, which I think can be useful in, in other contexts. Uh, this is something that I've been mentioning a few times on the Sling, Sling dev list already, uh, using the Sling 
script resolution mechanism to resolve other things. Like here, we're speaking about the content aggregation script. We can use the exact same mechanism. It's just a different type of script, but we can use the same uh, mechanism as the rendering scripts, you know, based on the HTTP request method, the, the, the resource type, and the selectors and everything. And it's actually quite simple, quite easy to do. I'll show the example, the code in the next slide. So you get a, you get, you take the request from the client, you wrap that request in a, in a, you know, servlet uh, request wrapper object, which uh, introduces a fake HTTP method. The, the original request was a get, and here we say, no, it's an ag, A-G-G, for aggregation. Meaning, I, want, I don't want to get a get script, I want to get an aggregation script. And then you pass that to the Sling script resolver, which looks in the, in the repository, and in this case, we'll find a script called, if the resource type is my app, it will find a script called uh, slash app slash my app slash agg.js, because it thinks agg is the HTTP method, and that, that's what you get. And then you can get this, the text of the script and do whatever with it, execute, execute it with the appropriate uh, sling, uh, scripting engine. So this is, uh, I think this is a pretty simple technique to reuse the Sling resolver to uh, get other types of scripts. This is the code, it's not very complicated. Uh, you call the ser servlet resolver, resolve servlet method with a change method request, re request wrapper. So this wrapper that you know, fakes the, the request method. And then you adapt to, I hope I get bonus points for having adapt to in my example code here. <laughs> um, then you adapt the result to an input stream, and if you get that, you can get the script text and pass it to your custom script engine or, or do, do whatever makes sense to it. So that's, uh, I think that's an example, that's something that could be useful in other contexts. Uh, my second experiment was using Sling Query for the, uh, for the um, content aggregation. So Sling Query is not a very popular module, uh, <laughs> but I think the, the concept is great because it's, it's doing queries kind of like jQuery does on the DOM, but using the Sling uh, you know, tree model. So for example, you could, you could ask, the first uh, example in bold is get the siblings of the current resource resource.siblings, very, very convenient. The second example goes to the root, the, uh, finds the children of the root. It takes the resource, goes in the parents axis up to the end of that axis, which is the root, and then finds the children of that, that root. Uh, just to give you, know, you know, a few examples of, of that. And the third example uses a JCR query, anti-base, where title equals foo, to, find, to, to run a search and find the, find the examples. So I, I've been experimenting with using that in a Sling bindings values provider, so which gives you a new variable in your scripts that you can use that already has the aggregated content, and you can do your rendering in JSON or, or whatever you want to do. And it is inherently sandboxed, because it's... Um, no, it's not. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, here I'm using JavaScript to access a Sling query, so it's not sandboxed because I, I need the packages, I'm accessing Java classes. So I if you want to sandbox this, you would need to implement JavaScript sandboxing or, or sandboxing for whatever, whatever script you're using. But if you wanted to translate that into a mini language, it's not too hard. The grammar is pretty simple, so you could, you could relatively easily create a mini language that has just the Sling query syntax and then would be inherently sandboxed because it doesn't give you access to anything else. Uh, the third experiment was about the dynamic scripts servlet search path. This is something, an experiment that I did, uh, I think, two years ago. Sling 4386 is the JIRA ticket that describes it. Uh, actually, with a relatively simple modification to the, to the Sling uh, script uh, servlet resolver, you can introduce new multiple servlet resolvers. You know, uh, the typical extension point mechanism. Say, okay, I have a standard uh, servlet resolver, but if I, if I have a custom one that gives me a result, I ignore the standard one. So this would be useful for uh, taking scripts for, uh, from a tenant-specific folder. Instead of taking slash apps, you take slash example.com slash app because the current request was sent to example.com, for, exa uh, for example. Um, and this is, this is not hard, but it has impact on caching. In my prototype, I had to disable the server the script's cache Otherwise, it would, you know, get confused. 
So uh, if we want to implement that, we, we'd have to uh, you know, improve the, the caching to be aware of that. And the last experiment was playing with this Nashorn sandboxing. It's interesting because it shows you know, that it's not as simple as it might seem. Uh, I, I've been, there is, a, if you search for Nashorn sandboxing, there's a project from the Java Delight suite, which is called uh, Nashorn Sandbox. And, and does that. And here we, we're looking at the interface of that sandbox. So what, what are the options that you can set or you know, on the sandbox to decide exactly what you're allowed to do or not? So uh, the first method is allow, where which allows you to, which, which allow you JavaScript scripts to access Java classes, define which Java classes are ac accessible. That's actually probably the simplest one. An Astron has a class filter option, so you can decide exactly which classes are accessible or not, which can be good. And then you can inject global variables in your script. You can set the maximum CPU time. So this thing will kill your script if it uh, takes more than a given number of milliseconds. Um, the eval method is for evaluating a script. That's what you need. And then it has a number of allow methods. Say, can you do print from the JavaScript code? Can you do read? Can you read stuff uh, from, from the JavaScript code, etc.? So you have a number of allow methods, which show, again, that you, there's some granularity here. You need to precisely decide what you, what you allow or not. And then you also have the global objects. So Nashorn gives you access to the arg line of the JVM or from the, the process environment, has an exec, which sounds a bit scary. So you can, you can limit these things. And it shows that the Again, the, I think the, the blacklist approach is, uh, is not totally reassuring because it feels so, so easy to forget something. And then if you look at the source code of this sandbox, I, I don't know if it's the best sandbox around, but uh, that's how they did it. And they, they, uh, apparently, they, they spent some time looking at this. Uh, so for the classes, it's using NAS1 class filter. That's cool. And for the other thing, it's kind of rewriting your JavaScript code or adding a, you know, a prologue to your code to disable some stuff. And to me, this sounds a bit scary because it's, you know, it feels so easy to forget something and, and, and then uh, open up uh, security uh, issues. So this is not really reassuring to me in terms of sandboxing uh, JavaScript. I've also been looking at the Groovy sandboxing, uh, and it's kind of similar. In Groovy sandboxing, they're acting on the compiler to limit some constructs in the compiler. Sounds cool, but then maybe you find a different construct which ultimately ends up doing the same thing. So it's not really if I had to do something like that and it has to be safe, uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, do doing your custom language is probably the much safer way of doing that. OK, so what do we do? This would be my conclusions. Um, so the the. If you remember the slide about the, 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 the current Sling pipeline where you do the content aggregation and it's all in memory, I think that's a very important aspect of Sling that's often overlooked and allows you to do very efficient systems uh, you know, if they're they can be dedicated to that. So I think that's a great differentiator in good and bad ways. You know, it's great if you have enough RAM and you can run your system, but you have to understand that in the way you, you define your Sling uh, applications. I think the hybrid rendering form uh, is the most prom promising, trying to streamline, have the same uh, pipeline for most of your stuff, and then allow dynamic routing for, for the, the different stuff. This is the approach that I would take if I had to do this today. If you really need it, you have to you know, ask yourself, do we need that kind of scaling? Uh, sandboxing is difficult. I've been mentioning that a few times. Whitelisting uh, is much preferred, starting from zero and then just opening up the things that you really want to open. Uh, so I hope that my experiments can be useful, maybe in other contexts, or if you have to build something like that. Uh, so, you know, this, is, this has been kind of the approach. Explore the different variants and, and come up with a few building blocks that could be useful for that. I'm sorry that I don't have a complete prototype, but if I had one, it would just show one of these options. So I think it's, uh, it's good to have a kind of a building blocks and a, and a, and a toolbox for that. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. So if you've got any questions, um, raise your hands, and we're going to uh, put some mi micros to you uh, so you can voice your question. 
I'll be here for three days, so you can also, you're also welcome to grab me in the hallways. Okay, oh, so you left speechless. Oh no, there's one question here in the front. Hey, um, I, I was just wondering, so, well, so, so, at the one hand, um, the idea of having, having the content aggregation ahead of time, so, I mean, that, that makes it difficult up to a point, right, because we don't know what what scripts or what includes actually going to happen because mm -hmm. they're based on the on the scripts in, yeah. in the one hand and and potentially even on you know stuff we don't know about like user or whatever that right. the script will you know recognize and say I go this way or that way so somehow yes. there, there would need to be some kind of mechanism to to tell this uh, aggregator ahead of time well it's likely at least that we yeah. need these resources yes right? but and so how do we plan to address that was one question and the related to that and granted, that's a f more of a moonshot kind of thing. But uh, the, the alternative I always think is that if if you go to, towards this kind of reactive async model where you use HTTP to to, to route between components, um, it's sort of an event-driven system, right? And what you wa what you at least traditionally wanted to do in an event-driven system is somehow to experiment with saying, well, you don't want to have the data go to your mm -hmm. processors. You want to have the processor go to the data. Yes. Did you think? you know, in that area a little bit, because you could see it the other way around too, right? Dispatch yeah. it to something that runs close to the data it needs. Yes. You mm -hmm. know, instead of, of, of getting the data and send it to yeah, somebody and else. Sending, yeah, yes, right. Uh, so to, to the first question, the content aggregation, uh, I totally agree that uh, it would be a fairly different way of building the application. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to scale, I think it's great also to push out some rendering to the clients. So, and, and if you do that, you have to do the content aggregation. You want to send a complete block of content to the client so it can do the, their rendering in one, you know, in one go, don't have to do multiple requests. So I agree that it would be a very, very different way of doing things. You could maybe imagine running your scripts in a different mode. You know, you could, maybe you could take your rendering, rendering scripts, uh, HTL or something, uh, and run them, analyze them, and run them in a different mode, which just does the content aggregation. And then, uh, you know, uh, the same script might be used for rendering uh, down the line. But I agree that's a, that's a pretty different model. Uh, but I think in some cases, we'll, we will have to, to go through that. So it's, it's a good thing to, to think about it. On the other question, if I understand correctly, you're thinking that, uh, yeah, in my model, I'm passing the content through all the whole chain, so it's copied uh, all the time. Uh, it depends how big the content is, then that's, that's the question. Uh, if it's small enough, it will work. If it's large enough, it won't work, and you don't know what's small and large enough. Uh, the other way, uh, if I understand it, you would mean it's at to maybe send an event to a queue and have it analyzed and then decide where you want to, to process it. Um, actually, I've always wondered why, why we don't do web dynamic web servers like that. It so would sound like a very, very uh, efficient way of doing things. Uh, that that's a larger change, though. So. Where the data is. Right? So, so send event to some processor that's close to the data that yes. this processor will need. Yes. Right. So I mean, uh -huh. you can send the memory around, yeah. or you send the code around, basically. Yes. Right? Yes. So, yes. And, and if, right. I, if I know, right. okay, this is going to be for this client, and, and he has all his data in this data store. Yeah. Yes. And, I, and I send it to something that runs in the data store. Yeah. It can locally do lots of includes and, 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 and things because it runs against, you know, at least right. that, that, that partition of the data, right? Yeah. That's another way of doing it, right? You send either the code. Yeah, or send the, the code, okay. So yeah. we'd, you would have an execution, a content server, which can execute these, these aggregation or rendering scripts, and you would find a script somewhere, send it to the thing, and have it execute. You have the topic for your conference next year, Carl. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Carl has already his abstract for next year. <laughs> uh, I think that that would be a very interesting uh, idea to explore. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, Bertrand will be outside certainly in the break. We're going to have a break. Uh, I'm sorry? Ah, there's another question. Sorry, I haven't seen that one. <laughs> I didn't want to hold up the break. Can you, <laughs> do you mind uh, going back to the slide that had the, the rendering script example? Which one? This one. So I, I don't quite get why there's three things in the result. With uh, 
would there really only be one? Yes. And you're just showing three examples? No, it's, so uh, my thinking with that, uh, if, you, if you're thinking uh, as the output of this as a JSON object, uh, it, this would be the, the, uh, the top, you know, you have your object called result or something, then it has a siblings subtree and a chi root children subtree and a query result subtree. So that's, that's the idea. So it's kind of a tree built of three different uh, Sling query uh, queries. And then the idea is that the, the rendering process needs, or potentially needs, this sort of cause point, all, it both could need the siblings, the children, yes. and the query yeah, yeah, Yes, yes, yes. The, I think the example is not fantastic in terms of content. It's not, probably not very useful content. But it's, you know, I wanted just to show the different, different Sling query mechanisms. Okay. Uh, a more realistic example would be a page, and then you aggregate images and comments and, uh, and a menu, menu bar or something like that, which is relevant to that page, would make more sense. Yeah, thanks.